Welcome in folks, few things I wanna to react to here today on the Reaction Channel. First one up here is uh, something from X that I saw out there around uh, Tevis talking about going all in five stocks. So I wanna speak about that strategy and those stocks in this video. I saw this out of Amit, he posted around about Walmart's earnings. I wanna speak for, uh, in terms of Walmart earnings, they were actually really, really impressive for just a moment, okay? Then we're gonna go ahead and react to these two videos here. Nvidia has the highest earnings expectations of all time. Wow, that's a big statement, okay? So we're gonna get into that video, I'm looking forward to getting into that one. And then last one up here, Mohammed Al-Aladian, speaking about the Fed, soft landing, all that good stuff. Appreciate y'all joining me as always. All I ask in return, that you smash a like, and that you're subscribed here to the channel. We're gonna hit 40,000 subscribers this week on this channel, so I appreciate each and every one of you being here. And also, if you wanna follow me on X, otherwise known as Twitter, or uh, follow me on Instagram, I'll have those as the pinned comment down there today. Feel free to follow me on there, say hello, all that good stuff, okay? Alrighty, so, let's get started here with this one. I, I saw this last night and I was like, oh, I should react to that, that's an interesting subject, okay? So Tevis had tweeted out this, if they still call it tweeting now, I don't know, maybe they don't call it that anymore, I still call it that. Thinking of going, uh, selling almost all my positions going all in a five stock portfolio. The five stocks he's talking about is Tesla, SoFi, uh, Unity, Pins, and Celsius. Okay, so <clears throat> he says these are by far my favorite names, I have the majority of my mind share and conviction. Everything else I don't really look at or I'm bullish uh, or as bullish on, okay? so. You know, let me first start out by saying this, okay? I've been in the market like 15, 16 years. There's nothing I haven't probably done in the game. I've gone all in five stocks. I've gone all in one or two stocks before. I've gone on margin before. I've done swing trading before. There's nothing I haven't done. And at the end of the day, what it all comes back to is I'm always better off having a well-diversified portfolio in long-term investing. It's what it always comes back to. Every single time I try to do this or that or try to get a little fancy or, ooh, let's go heavy on, you know, riskier stocks, always ends poorly. Whenever I just stay focused on building a great overall portfolio, 10, 15, 20 stocks, and let everything else be everything else, it always turns out the best for me. So let me start out by saying that first and foremost, as somebody that's been in this game a really freaking long time, okay? Next up. What do I think of his strategy of let's say going all in five stocks? So, I don't think it's I don't think it's a horrible strategy if you got a smaller amount of money and you're tighter on time, right? So, not everybody has the time to pay attention to 20, 30, 40 different stocks and keep you know, listen to all the conference calls and all the investor reports and all those sorts of things. So if you have a smaller amount of money, I can understand just having five stocks, right? And I don't know, you know, how much Tevis has or doesn't have, but it, let's say he has like, let's say he has under 50K. Okay, I understand five stocks. You know, if you got 25K, 30K, something like that, I understand it, right? But over time, I think it, it's better to build out a 10, 15, maybe 20 stock portfolio. 20 stocks are starting to get, you know, maybe a little over diversified for some people that are individual stock pickers. Now, what do I think about these five stocks? Well, <clears throat> I don't like it. I don't like it at all, okay? First off, pins, I just don't like it in general. Unity, eh. The, the, there's a lot of issues here, okay? A lot of issues. The first issue is he, does, he doesn't have a big money maker. The, none, one of those companies is a big money maker. Tesla's the biggest money maker of the bunch. And as somebody that's been a Tesla shareholder for like 100 years now, I'm just telling you, like, Tesla makes very little money compared to their market capitalization of the company. And Tesla, in terms of what they're going to bring in in 2024, it's not a big money maker stock in terms of like net income wise, right? SoFi is barely getting the infant stages of net income, right? Unity, ugh. Pins, ugh. Celsius, super high valuation, and they're a smaller money maker as well. So overall, when I look at that, there's just there's a lot of holes there. There's there's not a lot of diversification between different industries. And uh, where's the big money makers? You know, there's just, there's nothing there. And that's the type of portfolio that those type of stocks, if you're in a major risk on market, let's say the next 24 months, 12 months, 12, 12 months, 24 months, whatever, super risk on, everything to the moon, Bitcoin to 100K, 150K, everybody's, 
you know, it's back to 2021 vibes, sure, that portfolio is going to do very well because those are all what you would kind of put into more of a speculative higher valuation category. Let's say we don't have that sort of market and it's, um, you know, a stagflation type market. Those positions will all struggle immensely in that sort of market. So, you know, th- that's kind of what I would say about that overall. Okay. And it's a lot, it's a thought that goes through a lot of people's minds. They're like, oh man, I just want to go all in. And let me tell you guys what usually, because you got to ask yourself, like, what, where, why do you go there mentally? It, it, it really has nothing to do with this part down there. I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, okay? On a psychological level, it comes down to one of these two things. Either you're going there because you're not making money in the market, and so you're like, gosh, man, like, I got to start making money. Like, like, you know, I need a position. That could be one. That, that might not be the thing with Tevis, but that could be one way. The second way is you are making money, but you're looking and you're like, dang, man, I need to make more money, more money, more money. And that happens a lot of times when you're, you've had a really good market for a while and people are looking out there and they're like, dude, why am I in you know, this many stocks? I need, to, I need to concentrate. I need to, you know, so it can happen, you know, and, and that's, that many times is what kind of pushes you there. It's one of those two scenarios. And I, if I think about myself before, and I think about the time I was all in like one stock, two stocks, even three stocks, it was usually because I was coming off of a period where I made a lot of money and I was kind of deep down looking back now and in, in being mature about the situation. It was greed. It was just like, dude, like I want to make even more. And if I think about the only other times I've really done that, it was time periods when I hadn't really been making money. And I'm like, dang, man, like, come on. Like, I need my fix here. I didn't even start making some money. So, you know, I, I've seen it all, done it all. That's the name of the game, okay? Next one up here, Amit posted this. He said, uh, so Walmart crushed earnings, beat revenue by $3 billion, $173 billion versus $170 billion, beat EPS by $0.15, cents, $1.80 versus $1.65, AdBiz up 33%, e-commerce business up 23%. You know, we got the stock split going. Yeah, that's the new hot, the new hot item out there, right? There. And then the acquisition of Vizio, which is kind of interesting. So, you know... I'll say Walmart's actually been putting up really impressive numbers. I mean, I'm kind of almost borderline shocked at how impressive Walmart's numbers have been. You know, for a very sleepy company, sleepy stock, it's been, they've been, they've been putting it up, man. And so good for them. Is it a stock that is interesting to me? No. I still think at the end of the day, Walmart stock is a bit of a mirage and I don't think they're going to be able to keep up even remotely close to this sort of growth rates over time. And, um, you know, they, they, there was a high inflationary cycle that we went through, obviously, in 22, 23. I think that allowed Walmart to take a lot of pricing on a lot of products that they hadn't been able to do in a long, long time. And I think they took advantage of that. And I think you're seeing it play out in the revenue numbers and EPS numbers. And let's just be honest, they could get away with it. Because at that particular time, everybody was expecting to go into your Walmart every week and, and pay higher prices. Same thing with the food store and everywhere else. And so I think this is really helping out Walmart immensely. But I do think this goes away. And I don't think you're going to be able to you know keep raising prices and those sorts of things. And I think a lot of you know what why they're beating these revenue numbers, why they're beating these EPS numbers, putting up that, I think a lot has to do with the, the raising of prices. And like I said, they justified it with... Oh, you know, everything's going up. Our suppliers are going up, of course. That's what everybody's going to say, right? But at the end of the day, I think I know what's actually going on there, okay? All right, next video up here we're going to get into is NVIDIA. NVIDIA earnings are in 24 hours from now. I will be live streaming those earnings on Twitch. If you want to join me on Twitch, make sure you join me for that one in, in 24 hours from now. And uh, Etsy's also reporting. Dutch Bros reporting that day. And who else reporting? Cheesecake Factory is reporting. Maybe a, a, a Lucid, Rivian. It's going to be a crazy one tomorrow. So anyways, let's get into this. Chris, do we commonly see the expectation of an 11% move up or down in a nearly $2 trillion market cap stock? Uh, hey, no. We actually never have. Um, if, you add the, uh, if you multiply the market cap by the implied move, it's the biggest uh, earnings expectation um, of all time. You know, we went back and we looked through COVID when Apple was still pretty high market cap. And uh, we really have never seen this before. You know, uh, an implied move in market cap after earnings of about 200 billion. Now, that's the entire size of a company like Disney uh, or Cisco. 
so safe to say we haven't really seen this before. So, uh, and I, people, there's a difference between trading and investing. So not implying that people should do anything here. But I also wonder to what degree is this move, if it happens, and there are bets that it will, going to impact the market overall or other stocks in this? So there's a conspiracy theory around NVIDIA, okay, and what's going to happen in these earnings. And the conspiracy theory goes as follows. NVIDIA's numbers are going to be good, good numbers all around, but maybe there's like one or two disappointing things. And NVIDIA stock doesn't move big at all. And the thought process is, so NVIDIA's expected implied move, I believe, is 11% to the upside or downside. Everybody's expecting a big, huge move out of NVIDIA. And so the conspiracy theory is market maker just wants to collect a bunch of premium here and uh, everybody's options on the put side and the call side for this coming Friday would all expire near worthless uh, because they're all expecting, especially anything you know far out of the money. And, and people are just like, what the heck? Like, why is this stock not really moving? And it's like, a two to four percent move after earnings is something like, like put me to sleep. So that's conspiracy theory. That might not happen, by the way. And I, I don't really have an, a, a strong opinion, but <clears throat> you know, I don't know. We'll see. But that's conspiracy theory, and we'll see if it comes true or not. I cohort that have also been pretty volatile lately. I mean, this is a major pivot point for this, you know, current AI semi tech bull rally. I mean, it has showed signs of getting tired. If you look at the NASDAQ, it's basically flat over the past month while um, NASDAQ volatility, the VXN is one way to measure that. That's been moving higher. So expectations are are sky high, even just to meet expectations. So, you know, that might be why you're seeing the stock pulling back a little bit today. Um, I think the rest of the market is kind of queuing off this earnings on tomorrow. What kind of circular effect can some of this options activity have to, uh, you know, those who are equity holders in the sense that uh, if they do have a, a, a sizable impact, um, you know, after the print crosses tomorrow, what does that mean for those who are maybe, say, more momentum traders or even mom and pop traders who are kind of watching the activity and, and having a FOMO either to the upside or the downside? You know, surprisingly, probably not as much of an impact as you would think. Over the last two weeks, this implied move, that 11 percent, that's kind of been bid up. So that's telling you that a lot of people are buying options. So what you might actually find is after this event, um, you know, we might see a sharp initial move, but then we're going to see a lot of options selling. That's actually going to mute volatility. Now, um, a lot of that has been buying upside calls. Now, if the stock sells off, those calls are kind of going to just go away and not need to be hedged. So sure. um, maybe not necessarily a ripple effect out of the options if we're assuming that a lot of people are buying options ahead of this event. In a way, what this reminds me of, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong here. By the way, in these earnings are, and I think this is important everybody understands this, because this is way bigger than just NVIDIA. This earnings report that's about to be reported by NVIDIA is going to shake up countless other stocks in the market. Anything that's in the AI trade, as they call it, is going to move huge based upon these NVIDIA earnings. I think some of these other stocks might actually move bigger on a percentage basis than actually NVIDIA, which is crazy to think because NVIDIA is the one that's reporting the numbers, right? The other MAG7, that's going to move huge this week. So you're going to have massive movements that some of these movements could be bigger from these other stocks after NVIDIA reports than actually NVIDIA's uh, like numbers are, okay? And so, whoo! Um, but what I will say is if NVIDIA comes in and just blows it out of the water again, NVIDIA is climbing to a thousand, not climbing to a thousand this week, but it's climbing to a thousand over the next, you know, few months. If they come in and just smash it again in terms of that guidance and everybody's like, oh my gosh, they just killed it again. So, yeah. Meta, formerly Facebook in early 2022, right? In the sense that there was, it's a pretty big stock, not as big as NVIDIA is now. And what we ended up with was a big move that got people arguing that the narrative had changed, now we can see to a degree that, that's greater than it actually did. So what did you see in the options market, not just in Meta, but around related names after that big move in 22? Well, you know, the options market has, is just continuing to grow, and it's usually you know, really smart. If you think about it, everyone's looking at NVIDIA. There's a ton of options being traded. You can feel pretty comfortable with um, the 11% move being relatively fair. Now, 
when it's stopped. Not all of it's smart, though. A lot of it's just degenerate gambling. I'll just <clears throat> be honest with you guys. <clears throat> this is like the Super Bowl for stock market investing, right? A lot of people want to get their bets in. Oh, I think NVIDIA is going to tank. Oh, I think NVIDIA is going to go up. It's just a lot of it is not intelligent, smart people making like investing business decisions. It's just degenerate gambling. No different than you gamble on the Super Bowl or something like that. So I want to. I want to put that out there. Really catches you off guard, like Meta did, well, as you mentioned, or three and four quarters ago, uh, NVIDIA really caught everybody off guard, you know, beating by an incredible amount, and you had these massive 14 and 24% moves higher in the underlying. Now that's kind of being expected. Um, you know, obviously NVIDIA could surprise and, and really have a, a, a worse number, but really it seems like this... Um, Incredible performance is still ex is now expected out of this stock, uh, and part of the reason we're seeing that 11 percent move is because of those big moves that we saw recently, uh, and it might even be a little bit overinflated. We'll see. Next one up here, Mohammed Al Aladian. Let's hear what's going to happen with the economy. Me the Fed. Join us now. Well, All that good stuff. Arian, a chief economic advisor at Allianz and. Uh, president of Queens College at Cambridge University, and, and I don't know what what that told us last week, uh, Muhammad. No one thought the move all the way to two percent uh, was going to be a straight line. We we know about you know progress is made, and you you know you get a little bit of a of a setback. It's not just a straight line, but was it more troubling than that? We knew that. Was there something more troubling in those numbers? I think those numbers just confirmed how bumpy that the last mile of getting to 2% will be. And you've, you're seeing expectations move tremendously. Joe, two months ago, we were pricing in six to seven cuts. Today, some people are even saying maybe we'll get a hike. I don't think we will, <laughs> but it shows you how much the conventional wisdom has shifted. And that's because consistent with what you've heard just now from Walmart, people realize that there's a limit to goods deflation, goods prices actually coming down, and service inflation stays sticky, which means that getting to 2% is going to be tricky. The, uh, would it surprise you, Mohammed, if we got only two rate cuts this year? It was like my pool bid, man. I got that pool bid. I was expecting it not to be too crazy. $150,000? Come on, man. Wasn't he, I mean, you know, decent little nice pool, but I'm like $150,000? I'm like, oh my gosh, but you know, that goes back into that services inflation. Plus, obviously, you could say maybe a little bit of goods in terms of the, the parts and things that are needed for it, but I was like, gee. Up until the second half of the year, is that looking more likely now? No, I've been in the three cuts in starting in June, so two cuts wouldn't surprise me. Um, my hope is that the Fed realizes that they have to think much harder about the soft landing glide path to 2%. It's going to be much longer than they would like, which is another way of saying that 2% inflation is not shouldn't be the immediate target, should be the much longer term target. Um, but the glide path is going to be longer than expected. We have to maintain this U.S. exceptionalism in growth. It's been something that has allowed for a softish landing so far, and it's also serving as a global as the global locomotive for the international economy. Well, that was fine until, as long as inflation was behaving, it was a it was the kind of Goldilocks that we love the strong economy. Are we back to thinking that the Fed needs to slow down the economy, and that if that's true, if they do need to do that with interest rates? They can always overshoot, and then we're back in the possibility of a hard landing. Okay, so we are in restrictive territory in terms of interest rates. So the question is, how long do we stay in restrictive territory? Um, this economy is, is slowing, but it's not slowing into recession, and that's something that is really important for the well-being of the economy, for the well-being of the global economy. So the risk is, Joe, that the Fed ends up in restrictive zone for too long. That is the risk right now. That is the potential policy error. Very different from where we were when you and I were talking in 2021, when the Fed was thinking inflation would be transitory. 
Now there's a risk they'll make the policy error the other way around. So well, we... It, it, well, if we're really in- the scary thing is, you know, you could say the Fed was in accommodative mode for nearly 15 years, right? Like, you know, 13, 14 years, the Fed was in pretty accommodative mode. Uh, so, you know, to say, the, 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 how long has the Fed really been working against the market? The, the Fed's really been working against the market for um, a little over a year and a half now at this point in time, right? In any substantial way, about a year and a half. So when you take into account the Fed was very accommodative for like 13 plus years and they've been, let's call it working against the market, not accommodative for maybe 18 months, you know, they might, they might have to be there for a bit. Territory, we've been in there, we've been there for a while. Why haven't we already seen that reflected in the jobs? A while's the relative. GDP. That's relative. So first we've seen it in inflation. Inflation has come down sharply. Why haven't we seen it in GDP? It turns out that we have an exceptional economy. It turns out that there was much more resilience. Balance sheets were much stronger um, than people had expected, both at the corporate and household level. It turns out that we are an incredibly agile economy. It turns out that we are starting to promote more and more the future drivers of growth. You know, I'm speaking to you from the UK. Look around the world. UK, recession. Germany, recession. Japan, recession. China, struggling. The US has been able to navigate this period of tighter interest rates well, and it's something that we hope will continue. I just don't know how to to view that, that if the rest of the world, you know, we, we can be you know, the exception to the rule, or we can just join everyone else eventually. You don't think that's likely <laughs> that, that, that we're just going to be the last to, to, to actually see a, a, a slowing economy. You think we, we continue to maintain our preeminence? So to be clear, I think we, we will be a 1% to 2% growth economy. I don't think that we need to fall into recession unless we get a policy mistake or an external shock. Um, Joe, household balance sheets in the U.S. Was, were much stronger in the rest of the world. Why? Because the fiscal transfers were stronger. So that helped growth last year, but it's not going to help growth as much this year. So we're not going to go at the 4.9% pace of the third quarter, the 3.3% pace of the fourth quarter. We will go to 1% to 2%, but there's no need for us to fall into recession. All right, we will see. Uh, so well, let me tell you guys a, a big issue. That is, well, there's a couple issues. The government's kind of working against us in terms of trying to get inflation really back down to the 2% number. I just got to be honest with you guys, okay? And when I say they're working against us, I'm talking about the state government side and the federal government side, okay? The federal government has, you know, big spending bills that have gone through and they're spending a lot of money. Let's just call it that. I don't think that's a rocket, like earth shaking news to anybody. Like the federal government spending like it's nobody's business, right? But on top of that, you have a lot of states that have had minimum wage going up considerably either last year or this year. A good example is California. California's minimum wage has gone up substantially this year. And that affects a lot of things. Like, you know, if I think about a company I own, Cheesecake Factory, right? They have, oh gosh, probably, oh, let me think, probably over 15% of their locations in California. Well, if minimum wage goes up substantially, guess who's going to end up paying more for that? It's going to be the customer, right? If Walmart, we talked about Walmart earlier, if suddenly minimum wage is several dollars more, they have to up their wages of all their employees, right? And you boom, boom, boom. So is Walmart take that hit or do they pass it on to the consumer? Well, they're going to pass it on to the consumer and then some, probably, right? And so that's where you get in this dilemma of like, oh, that's cool. That's good. People are making more money, more wages. You know what else happens? More inflation and more of the price is going to go up because these big companies, they're not going to eat that. Be like, oh, okay, we got to raise Johnny's, you know, we got to raise, wait, you know, raise his wages two dollars an hour because the state said so. So, you know, we're just gonna eat that. No, they're gonna pass that right on to you. And then Johnny, when he goes to buy stuff, it's all gonna be much more expensive than it was the previous year. So that's where you get into a bad d- dilemma there, and then you risk obviously stagflation over time, right? If you stay in kind of that sort of environment for too long, then you risk stagflation. So. You know, this is an evolving dynamic. You know, it's going to keep being a drama show. And I don't really see the drama show ending in terms of the thought process of like, 
oh, they're they're going to start cutting or, oh, they're not going to cut. Or, you know, there's still going to be so much debate about this for the next at least year in terms of how many cuts will be coming and when are they going to start cutting and those sorts of things. Um, hikes, I think it's pretty unrealistic unless we get CPI to go back over four. If that happened, whoo, could could the Fed actually start raising it? I mean, it's, it's possible. If CPI was to go back over the fives, that's a number for sure that, oh my gosh, the Fed have, have to come back in. It'd be devastating the market. Devastating. And I think it would, at the end of the day, I think that would end up uh, hurting the economy really, really substantially at that point in time. If the Fed had to go back to hiking again, let's say six months from now or 12 months from now, oof, watch out then. Because we were able to take the first hit because we were in a really good position going in, right? The second hit, uh-uh, 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 no bueno, okay? All right, guys, appreciate you joining me. As always, much love. Thanks so much for being here. If you want to follow me on X, then check out pin comment down there. If you want to follow me on Instagram and say hello to me, send me a DM, check out pin comment down there. Thanks for being here, folks. Much love, and have a great day.